for them. The first element was this, that in 1973, as I've mentioned, there was this huge uh, sort of uh, oil price rise. And the result of that was there was massive amounts of dollars sloshing around in the Gulf states. Saudi Arabia just had incredible amounts of dollars stashed away. What was it going to do with, uh, what were they going to do with, that, with all those dollars? Sort of stick them under the mattress? No, you can't do that. The world economy would crash, you know. So what are they going to do? How are they going to recycle all of that, all of those dollars back into the global economy? Well, we know two things, and this is where the American imperial story comes in. We now know from British intelligence documents that were released last year that British intelligence had wind of the fact that the United States was preparing to invade Saudi Arabia militarily in 1973 and occupy the oil wells in order to bring the oil price down. We don't know how far those preparations went, whether this was just contingency planning or what it was, you know, how far it went, we don't know. But we certainly know that was being actively discussed within the U.S. administration at the time at some level or other and, uh, and, and to some degree of, uh, uh, of certainty. What we do know for sure is that the American ambassador to Saudi Arabia around 1975 had a long conversation with the Saudis in which they negotiated with the Saudis that the Saudis would give exclusive rights to the recycling of all of the petrodollars which the Saudis had and then this is going to apply to many of the other Gulf states, they were all going to be recycled through the New York City banks. That is, the New York City banks got exclusive rights to take all of that money and bring it back into the country, and, and therefore they got the business. Now this posed an immediate problem, and the immediate problem was, well, New York City bankers now had all of this money. Where were they going to put it? They couldn't put it into New York City because the property market was depressed. The U.S. economy was depressed. Where were they going to put it? Companies were going bankrupt left, right, and center. Where were they, what were they going to do? Walter Riston had the great idea. He said, well, we don't, lo le we don't lend to corporations. What we do is we lend to states. Because states don't go away. We can always find them. So that's when they started to lend vast amounts of money to Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Poland, you know, even African states. And so they, 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 had, they took all of this money and they sent it to places like that, Chile as well. So th this was great business. And of course, this tremendous amount of money that was now flowing through New York City ensured the fact that New York City and Manhattan in particular was going to be the center of a lot of global financial operations. I mean, we always like to think, well, you know, New York is naturally, as it were, the center of this. Well, it's not natural at all. Here's a moment when it could have gone elsewhere, things could have gone elsewhere. Uh, right now, we see other rival financial centers where the money could go, but how are we going to make New York maintain its position as the global financial center? Well, they secured that by this imperialistic gesture in 1975, and nobody quite knows whether there was an active threat against the Saudis of invasion, and which said, you, you know, we're going to invade you, and the Saudis said, no, don't do that, we'll recycle all the money through New York banks, and then they'll keep okay. We don't know quite which, which way that, 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 that worked out. Anyway, the oil price hike was great business for the New York investment bankers. But lending to Mexico, lending to all these other countries was fine, until in 1982, Mexico went bankrupt. And it was at that point, and this is where the interesting thing comes in, it was at that point that the International Monetary Fund came into its own. Because if you are a real neoliberal theorist and you look at neoliberal theory, which is about keeping state out of government, then the IMF is not a good neoliberal institution. And to this day, a lot of right-wingers want to defund the IMF. So actually you find a curious alliance between left and right on getting rid of the IMF. So the IMF is not popular. And in fact, in the first year of the Reagan administration, we now know, they were going to defund the IMF. James Baker, then Secretary of Treasury, drew up a plan to get rid of the IMF. But then Mexico went bankrupt. And then the big question was, how are they going to 
deal with this. Because the bankruptcy of Mexico could go two ways, just like New York City. That was, on the one hand, if Mexico really went bankrupt and couldn't pay its debts, then what was going to happen to the New York investment banks? They were going to go bankrupt. They were highly exposed. Citibank and all the rest of it, Riston's organization, heavily, invo heavily, heavily exposed to Mexican debt. And it wasn't only Mexico that went under. Chile went under. Brazil was in trouble. Lots of other countries were in trouble. So at that point, they invoked that principle, which I've already suggested, which is when the integrity of financial institutions is threatened or the well-being of the people, you choose the financial institutions. And it was at that point that Baker turned to the IMF and said, okay, here's a role for you. Your role is to take it and suck it to the Mexican people and make sure that the money is extracted from Mexico to stabilize the New York banks. Now, this was the first disciplinary apparatus of this sort that the IMF did. In order to do that, you had to change the whole economic philosophy of the IMF. And Joseph Stieglitz, in one of his books, talks about the purge of the IMF in 1982, when they threw out all of those who were Keynesians, all of those who had Keynesian views of the world, and brought in all of the Chicago types, the monetarists, and all the rest of it. So they purged the IMF of all of those kinds of economists, brought in orthodox monetarist economists. And then what they did was they started to say to Mexico, it's not simply that you've got to get your budgets in order and all this, but you've got to start actually introducing reform. You've got to privatize. And this was when they started to say, privatize, privatize all of those state companies in Mexico. Privatize your oil industry, privatize your banks, privatize. So the pressure starts to be put on Mexico to privatize via the IMF. And this was, as it were, the carrying out, the way in which the pilot scheme which had emerged out of the New York fiscal crisis suddenly became part of the international disciplinary apparatus through the IMF.